we're running out of land to produce food. The good news, we can get our food from somewhere else. Farming fish has been the fastest growing food production method in the world, but it comes with problems of its own. Diseases, nutrient pollution and overfishing, to just name a few. So let's go out there and see if we can fix this. How can we farm the oceans sustainably? To find that out, I came here, Ireland. More specifically, to the salmon research site of the Marine Institute. It's specifically developed to farm salmon more sustainably, around 20,000 of them per year. At the same time, it produces three tons of seaweed and hundreds of different shellfish. I'll tell you why later. First, let's meet the people who run the show. Frank Kane, Joanne Cassidy and Neil Rain. So how bad are the waves out there? I'm, I'm, I might get seasick or, or no, not? No, no. Today we have a good one. We have a, quite a light breeze, so it's all fine. We have a little bit of sunshine. It won't be strong, but no waves. So it, hopefully we'll have a nice day. OK, there. OK. These are funky trousers. <laughs> the first thing I want to look into is the emissions associated with farming fish. Fish farms impact the climate in two ways. You need to feed the fish, obviously, and you also need the energy to run an operation like this. Then there are variables depending on how, where and what type of fish you farm. It can be in a bay area or back on land with closed loop tanks like these. Uh. This is surprisingly stable. <laughs> the tiny food pellets this machine shoots into the pond are responsible for more than 70% of farm fish emissions. And that's because of what's in them. That smells, smells quite fishy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and what's in this? So this is made for mainly fish meal um, with cereals and other fish oils. Um, fish needs high quality marine um, fish products within their food to supply them with omega-3 fats which they need for growth and health and um, in immune, their immune system. So the, the, chief, the primary product going into fish food would be fish meal, so which would be either fish caught at sea or the waste products in fish factories. And catching fish means emissions. You need to burn fuel to power the fishing boats. And you need to freeze or cool the fish once it's caught. But there are alternatives. For example, here they fed the salmon with fish waste instead of newly caught fish in the feed. And we do need these alternatives because the small fish that are in this feed are not available at large quantities in the sea anymore. Other ideas for low emissions fish feed are algae or insects. More commonly, soy is used as a substitute these days, but that's not without its problems. A lot of it is actually coming from places like America, China, and, but more controversially in Latin America. This is Alex Wan. He has been researching fish feed for years. Uh, where uh, large areas of forests are being uh, removed to grow uh, soy. And this is being transported across the different parts of the world. And this actually adds a lot of carbon emissions and also have a significant impact on nutrient runoff and uh, social impact as well. And then you can look at how efficiently you're using the feed. There's the so-called feed conversion rate, short FCR to measure that. It determines how much feed is converted into live weight by animals. Farm fish are pretty good at this. Their FCR is between 1 and 2.4. For pork, it's up to 5. And for beef, it's up to 10. So farm fish need less feed to gain weight. And that's because they are cold blooded. So they don't need as much energy as we humans, for example, to run their overall system. So they can devote more of this feed to growing. Getting a low FCR has to do a lot with finding the perfect feed composition. This can reduce the fish's environmental impact by as much as 24%. Along with the feed, there's another big factor. The emissions produced from the industry's energy consumption. And this really depends on where and how you grow your fish. Let's look at salmon, for example. It's bred in tanks on land or like here in open net pens in the ocean. 
Okay, the world's most tiniest windmill is here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it works very well. Um, so how much energy do you need to supply this whole operation? Okay, so here we have a small open pin um, fish farm system. So the requirements for energy on the site are relatively low. We do have a monitoring buoy over here, which is solar powered for the monitoring and the communication. We have a small wind energy and we have solar panels on top of this hut. So that's a power source that um, charges batteries for us to run the feeders and the, the small structures on site. And then we have a large generator here if we have to pump large volumes of water. From a sea site, this would be a relatively low energy cost one. Generally, the open pin system doesn't require the same amount of energy. You'd, recirculating systems, on land systems would have a higher demand because they have to pump water around and heat water. The difference is actually huge. A US study compared the impacts and if you keep salmon in tanks on land, your greenhouse gas emissions double. Farmed in open net pens, you're looking at 3.4 kilograms of CO2 per kilogram of salmon. And bred in tanks, you're stuck with 7 kilos. There is one effective way to get rid of these emissions. Use renewable energies. If you use about 90% renewables, you can cut the emissions of land-based systems toward the emissions of an open net pen system like here. But the world average of renewable energy in our mix is currently at 29%, so nowhere near that. And sadly, the problems don't end there. If you have a lot of fish in one place, you also have a lot of in one place. And when that gets too much, things get ugly. Too much fish poop in the water can in the worst case lead to an algae bloom that can eradicate all fish in your farm and tons of sea life on top. The fish basically suffocate underwater. Their excrements work like a fertilizer so algae grow like crazy and block out the sun, which kills many other underwater plants. This means less oxygen is produced and the bacteria decomposing the dead plants take up what little is left. In the end, the complete ecosystem collapses. In 2021, along the Chilean coast, 4,200 tons of salmon perished like this. For these 20,000 fish we got here, how much uh, fish are we actually talking about? So based on the literature values that we have, the uh, waste from the fish would be at about 20% of say maybe what they're fed per day. So on our site with our amount of fish that works out at about 3 kilos. That's about 1 tonne per year and when you overfeed the salmon it gets even worse. But the researchers here have an idea how to fix this. Oh, the magic word is polyculture. So growing different varieties of seafood alongside each other. So what's the kind of service that these scallops provide for this overall system? So we've chosen scallops, we also have oysters as part of our shellfish level and they're what we would call extractive species. So they would extract all of the particulate matter out of the water column. And how they do that is they have what we would call a beard and it's within the shell here and that filters the water um, and takes the particulate matter out of it and that's their food source. So they basically eat the shit? Basically, yeah, but they would eat, <laughs> say, the other particulate matter that's available in the water column too. So any zooplankton, maybe bits of detritus or you know, broken, but broken up bits of organic matter is all available to them to eat as well. And because of that, it's important where the scallops are placed. Because you want the current to bring the fish poop to your shellfish and not elsewhere. And the good thing environmentally is, the scallops don't require any additional feed. So you just hang them out in the water and wait for them to grow. The same goes for the next seafood that helps clean up the salmon's mess. That's quite a bit of seaweed. <laughs> More specifically, sugar kelp. You can eat this. Yeah, if you wanted to take a little bit to try. Okay. Yeah, it smells salty. But it's actually very much like salad. Yeah. And nice when you forgot your lunch, right? Yeah. <laughs> it grows along the main line that's just put in the water. It almost looks like a root system, you know, from your regular houseplants. And it grows really, really quickly. So we're at about 8 kilos a meter here. 
eight it's, kilos a meter. Yeah, this is getting to really more of the the higher growth season wow. for the time of the year. So it really prefers the colder waters it grows throughout the winter. And around now it's putting on maybe almost kind of a kilo a week in terms of growth rate. A kilo a week? That's yeah. insane. Yeah. So it's really fast growing plant material. In addition to the shellfish feeding on the small poop particles from the fish, the seaweed absorbs anything that's already dissolved in the water, like nitrogen and phosphorus that can also lead to algae blooms. It's an on-top extraction system that also produces more food, seaweed. Growing all these things at the same time makes the whole farm more sustainable and productive. But to what extent can the other species really offset the impact of fish farming? So probably averaged out overall, including maybe the filtration rates of some of the shellfish, about 20% of, um, of what we're producing here in terms of salmon is being offset by the extractive species. And that's only with, um, there's about four to 500 meters of long line out at the minute, and only about, say, 600 to 900 shellfish. So very, very small quantities. A polyculture farm like this can take care of one problem, nutrient pollution. A big one, yes, but other issues such as the spreading of diseases amongst farmed fish or chemical pollution with antibiotics remain. And that speaks to the crux of the matter. We can reduce the fish's impact, but we cannot eliminate it. Alternative feeds, polyculture, they don't solve the problem. If we want to do that, we need to get rid of the fish. I know it's super sad but I mean the seaweed didn't taste too bad after all. If you enjoyed me eating seaweed grown on fish poop please subscribe to our channel. We post new videos every Friday.